and you should get a little thing that says to agree to it. Okay. You can just click the OK button. All right. So like I said, I'm Maria Birchall. I'm head of adult services for SCLO. I'd like to welcome you once again to a poetry reading for of our Reflections on Americans and the Holocaust exhibition. This exhibition is the product of a partnership between SCLO Library and the Art Alliance of Central Pennsylvania. It includes 15 works by local artisans created in response to Americans and the Holocaust, a traveling exhibition for libraries, an educational initiative between the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, and the American Library Association. Now the traveling exhibition will open at Penn State University Libraries on January 29th, and it runs through March 10th at the TM Paterno Libraries on the University Park campus. We have a really great program arranged for you tonight. But first, again, a little housekeeping, please make sure your mics are muted unless you're reading. If you have comments for our readers tonight, you can feel free to share that in the chat box. I'm going to post and have posted our lineup there so our readers can keep track of who goes next. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marie Dahl, director of the Art Alliance of Central Pennsylvania. If I can find you, Marie, there you are. Oh, I see you, there you are. I'm going to pin you, hi, and I'm going to unpin me. Hi. There you are. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Uh, when Maria called me and asked if the Art Alliance would like to be involved uh, with this exhibition, um, I said yes immediately. Um, and she had asked me to spread the word to our visual artists uh, and ask them to do work for the show. Uh, but at at the same time, I suggested that perhaps we would include poets as well. Um, at the Art Alliance, when we have an exhibition, we often have poetry on a Sunday afternoon. And those events have been very, very popular. So um, that was the reason I thought um, through that, I've met so many talented poets and I thought that they would be a great addition to this exhibition, which they they have been. So um, you will hear them read their poems tonight. Um, I hope sometime during the month you will get down to SCLO uh, to see the exhibition. Uh, and Maria and her staff did a terrific job of uh, deciding how to mount the poetry on the wall. It's very professionally done and, and uh, makes for a wonderful exhibition. Um, to start, I'd like to um, first thank Steve Deutsch, who is very involved in poetry in the area. And he was responsible for contacting all of you and setting up the what we call the rundown tonight so that uh, everybody knows when they'll be reading. But he uh, is great to work with and Marie and I were both so happy to, to get him involved. So, um, to start, I've, there, two of uh, our visual artists are here tonight, um, and I've asked them to speak briefly about the inspiration for their work in this exhibition. Uh, so I'd like to first introduce Peter Pepe. Peter, uh, if you would tell us about your watercolor. Well, thank you. Yeah, this is a very difficult uh, topic. Uh, period. And uh, thank you for asking me about my inspiration and my perspiration on this painting. And, uh, you know, with a zoom, it's a little difficult because the painting is not here. So it's, you know, you know the visual part of it is gone. Uh, so I'm going to try to give you a background uh, quickly ab about it. Um, several years ago, I visited a museum in Miami. It was a Holocaust exhibit. And uh, it was photographs involving um, the camps and the people pre-war. Pre and an old man was there with a cane and everybody was crying and he started yelling. And the one thing he said was never again. And this sort of hit me and I never forgot this never again out of this Jewish man. And uh, since then I've uh, visited the uh, Holocaust Museum in Los Angeles and heard a lecture from a survivor, uh, the Holocaust Museum in Naples, Florida. 
the, a Holocaust exhibit in Washington, DC. So I've been surrounded by this stuff. And uh, I, I wanted to make sure that the word Holocaust, uh, to, you know, when I, you look it up, it's uh, Greek derivation. Um, they basically say it's burnt offering. So it uh, refers to concentration camps and the ovens. Uh, so if you're looking at the painting, you'll see it's predominantly red. I mean, everything in it is red, uh, point one. It's titled Kristallnacht, which is the night of broken glass. So people who are familiar with the Holocaust probably heard of that. But uh, in my notes, that's November the 9th through the 10th of 1938. At, in Paris, Germany, Austria, and a lot of Europe, um, three, 267 synagogues were destroyed, 7,000 Jewish businesses were looted and destroyed, 1,000 people at least were arrested and sent to camps. So if you look at the painting, you'll see that a lot of the images are fractured, uh, fractured and representing the broken glass. Um, and when you go to these Holocaust exhibits, uh, the uh, Jewish star is everywhere and the Nazi insignia is everywhere. So it's not one of those things that, oh my goodness, let's not have a Nazi insignia on a painting. It's everywhere at the exhibits. And um, so it's the two main symbols in the painting. Uh, also, you'll see there's a, the names are, are sort of burned on in a way, uh, like it's burned onto wood, representing uh, stamps on cargo, cargo boxes, like um, people that were basically put in uh, cattle cars. So, uh, the name Adolf Eichmann is on the lower left side, and the counter is Raoul Wallenberg. And up above is the Jewish star, and below is the Nazi symbol. So it represents Eichmann the destroyer and Wallenberg a rescuer. And the point is that he's one of many, many, many people who attempted to stop the genocide without war. Uh, but the most they could really do was rescue as many people as they could. So everybody uh, knows Oscar, Sch uh, you know, the Schindler's List, but Raoul Rollenberg is a representative of a rescuer. And uh, just quickly, Raoul Wallenberg was a Swedish architect, a diplomat, and a businessman, born in 1912. And he supposedly rescued 100,000 Hungarian Jews by faking their identification papers and making them Swedish citizens. So he represents one individual who's attempted to alter the genocide. Uh, the amazing part about that 1945, at the end of the war, the Soviets, or Soviet army took him and he supposedly died in a Soviet prison camp. Uh, so here are all his work and there's where he dies. And of course, uh, Eichmann was hung. So the dynamics of this painting, you'll look at it once you see it, it's basically polarization, Eichmann versus Wallenberg and Star of David versus Nazi insignia. And you'll see uh, gravestones representing basically war. And uh, uh, the only thing I can say is that it represents the dynamics of conflict. And the last point it is it's man's inhumanity to man. And lastly, the genocide, we think of it was like all the Holocaust, but it has never stopped. It continues on today in multiple, multiple ways in multiple, multiple countries. So it's a representation of the polarization that goes on and what went on really with the Nazi Germany versus the Jews and also all the others. We keep forgetting that all these, although the figure is 6 million Jews, uh, the museum's point out is probably 12 million at least because uh, various intellectuals, artists, um, uh, other diplomats, and anybody who is considered a uh, unwanted person, homosexuals, uh, were basically labeled for destruction. So that's the painting. I hope you all get to see it and enjoy it. Thank you. And if there's any questions, if you've seen it, I'll be glad to answer it. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Um, I, I guess we all really know why we have to, to go see the exhibition. Um, that was a wonderful description of your painting. Okay, uh, the other you. artist who is here is Ray Bilger. Ray, would you like to tell us about your inspiration? Sure, thank you, Marie. Um, my inspiration came from um, 
I was studying in Poland at a university in southeastern Poland in 1992. And um, at one point, um, my, some of my classmates and I who were, I was the only American there. So these people were from Sweden and, and Russia and Ukraine and, and uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, we decided that we would take a walk out to the Majdanek concentration camp. Um, it was hot. It was, it was July. It was, uh, it was really, really warm there that, uh, that year. So we'd walked the uh, five or so kilometers uh, out to the, the camp. At that point in time, uh, this was not too long after the, the, uh, the wall had fallen. And um, there was no one there. I mean, there were, there were no curators. Uh, there was no ticket booth or anything else. There was nowhere there, no one there to explain the exhibits. What they did was they took the long row houses that were used as barracks for the prisoners and they put wire fencing in uh, the middle so that you just had walkways on either far side of, the, uh, of each one of these uh, longhouses. And in the middle, in each one of these barracks, we had stacked something that was collected from the victims. Um, I can remember uh, on the way out there, of course, you know, we're all talking and everything else, you know, because we we're quite a quite a jovial group at the time and but when we walked got to the camp and we started to walk through these we didn't everyone was totally quiet because you walk in the first one and you see luggage piled floor to ceiling and the ceilings were really high there they're probably 15 20 feet and these buildings were at least 40 to 50 feet long floor to ceiling luggage just jammed in the next one you walk in there are eyeglasses, floor to ceiling. Next one, shoes, human hair, gold teeth, everything you can possibly imagine in each one of these houses. And you start, you, you, can, you can go to museums and, and you get a certain sense of what the Holocaust was like. You can read about it, you can watch films, and you get a certain sense of what the Holocaust was like. And I'm a very graphic person, which should come as no surprise as an artist. When you walk into these buildings, you, there, there's, a, there's something that touches you about that. that you, it's, a, it's a feeling that you simply can never shake. You realize and you can see right in front of you the horror that had to have happened there. And then at the very end, we walked through the, the crematorium. There were, at that point in time, there were still human bones and ashes in the crematorium. When you left the crematorium, you went to the gas chamber. And after we left the gas chamber, we started walking back. The caustic nature of whatever they use in the gas chamber still left a sore throat in our, in our, in our mouths 50 years later. It, I mean, you can just imagine the caustic nature of the chemicals that they use there. So the rest of the way back, um, five kilometers walking back to town, not one of us said a word. And it wasn't until we got to the first pub that we could find, no one said a word. We just all walked into it, got our first beer. And it was only after we had our first beer after that we could start to talk about what we had just seen. And it was still difficult. And it's still difficult right now. Then um, in 2005, I had uh, the privilege of being on uh, Vice President Cheney's uh, security team when he uh, went back to, uh, he and, and other dignitaries went back to Auschwitz-Birkenau in uh, southwestern Poland near Krakow. Um, and I worked on his team there for two weeks. And we, of course, as part of the security team, you have to check everything out. We walked through the, had to go through the entire camp. And again, you. There's just something about being physically there that really hits you. It just looks like a, it's like getting hit in the face with a sledgehammer, walking outside right now, you know, minus 13 Celsius or something. It's the same kind of feeling, but it's an emotional feeling that, you, that hits you and you take that with you whether you want it or not. Uh, that is what inspired me to do this painting. The design uh, was not my design. The design was actually that of a Polish graphic artist that was created for 
uh, the uh, month of national remembrance at, at Madonic for 1992, but the image just stayed with me because the symbolism of everything there um, with the, the barbed wire, with the rose that's made out of the, uh, the prisoner's cloth and the small red prisoner um, insignia on it. It's, it, it, and it's all in dark colors and it's done that way because of, you need to try some way uh, and failingly in this case, to show the darkness and the horror that transpired there, which is in my opinion, totally impossible to capture. But the fact that there's a rose there still shows hope. If we don't forget what happened, it will never happen again. And that's my hope is that we don't forget. Um, we need to be constantly reminded of this. Um, because when it's, and, and this exhibition I think is a great idea because we need to keep seeing this to be reminded that we can't ever let this happen again. Thank you, Ray, very much. Uh, I think Maria is going to introduce the poets. Is that correct? I can. Yep. One second. Okay. There we go. Zoom always takes just a little bit longer than it being in person. Um, so it is my pleasure to move us on to the poetry portion of the evening and uh, introducing uh, the first poem is Steve Deutsch. So Steve, I'm going to pin you just a second. There you are. How about now? Yes, I've got you now. Okay. Um, Roxanne couldn't be here. She wrote about an hour ago to say that there was someone sick in the family. So I'm first, and I think I'm also second. Um, my poem is uh, MS St. Louis. Um, and that seems to be a memory I've always had. It was the, um, it was chronicled in the book, The Voyage of the Damned, and also in a movie later in 1976. But I, I didn't know, I don't remember any of that. It's just, just something I knew. Uh, from Britannica, the St. Louis sailed from Hamburg on May 27th, 1939, with 931 passengers, most were Jews trying to escape Nazi Germany. Um, they were denied entry to Cuba, which was a popular destination while waiting for a U.S. visa. They were also denied entry into the United States and Canada. Um, running low on food, the ship was forced to return to Europe, where the passengers were eventually taken in by England, France, the Netherlands, and Belgium. 255 were killed during the war, the vast majority in concentration camps. And that's the last factual thing you will hear from me. MS St. Louis. My brother turned 13 this week. He was to take to the Bema and read from a Torah salvaged from our synagogue in Berlin. But he decided just the day before not to. At 10, I must start studying. Although my brother says, why bother since we're sailing east again? The mood on board the boat has changed since we left the lights of Miami behind Smiles are hard to come by, and my mom and dad are more than just seasick. The rabbi says we should forgive those who have forsaken us. But my brother says the rabbi's older than Methuselah, and we will bury him at sea before too long. Dad told us there is so much we have been blamed for that they fear a contagion like the Black Death arriving by ship in Messina in 1347. My brother shakes his head to agree. To help a Jew is to become a little Jewish, he says, and who would ever choose to be Jewish? But the boat steams on, and soon we will see Gibraltar again. Thank you.
think uh, Bob Lemer is the next reader and Bob is not well. Um, so you'll have to listen to me instead. I asked Bob if I could read his poem and he agreed. So I will try. And this poem is called Two Lives. Life may end in many ways, but having lived it well and full makes dying easier to concede. There is no acceptance of the end when stripped naked, masses forced into chambers to be cleansed, realize the sprinklers are spewing gas in a purging shower of death. Others follow that pernicious path when in due time the bodies of its sacked of jewelry have been removed to furnaces that will wholly erase last elements of their personal identities. And when the rescuers arrive, finding the remnant skeletal bodies facing them, their shock contrasts with survivors' smiles, welcoming the liberating troops. Full circle. Life has come to mend the minds and bodies of young and old, plundered so rapaciously by evil hordes, severing the bloodlines to their kin. Yet emptied by their loss, it was the time to greet the day, grasp the freedom, shout, Lachayim, and then remembrance. Thank you again. Thank you, Steve. Move on to Nicole. I think Nicole is up next if I'm doing this right. Yep. Hi, I want to first thank Stephen Deutsch. Uh, Marie Dole of the Art Alliance and Maria Burchill of Glow Library for organizing tonight's event. Um, and to my fellow readers tonight and everyone here joining in tonight's reflection. I want to dedicate my reading tonight to the memory of Stephen Herb, friend and former director of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. He shared our love of words and support at countless literary events like this one, and as someone with German roots, would have encouraged and appreciated tonight's gathering. I'm grateful to have known Stephen and all he gave to us. So when I wrote my poem, Letters Name Her Body, I was thinking about the space in a relationship between the giving and the receiving. And as someone who really loves letter writing and notes and all kinds of correspondence, I was drawn to a story featured in the Americans in the Holocaust exhibit online about two young women who were pen pals. Marianne Winter in Vienna, Austria, and Jane Bomberger of actually Reading, Pennsylvania, which was um, exciting to discover. These two developed their friendship across seas through letter writing and eventually paved the way for Marianne's family to safely emigrate to the United States. To reflect on this story and how to bridge differences. This is Letters Name Her Body. My dear friend without a body braids breath into my timeline without being. Each of us waiting weeks, waited, or surrendering to a soft length. I can show you she is real. The pulse of her pen, a slanted precipitation I only receive because I accept letters of her name to my tongue. Try her address. Each response is what makes the difference. The pages from her country skipping time, the same, touch delivered, fingers weaving and pulling, each word I try on, bodiless. It is always possible, my voice, suspended overseas, a pulp will be lost or held. I tuck and fold every element to exist with her. Hold clouds with the photograph she sent. I wait. She waits. Thread slick and unpredictable. I thank her for the bracelet 
I circulate against my temperature while I imagine undoing the knot, thundering in her hand as her face was forced close to floors to scrub on her knees, her knuckles, or being punished with boot-stained suds I want to rinse. Our weather so far, I fear are dissolving when silence gives and gives and gives. Shapeless, it is possible to draw air from envelopes. I answer, dear friend without a body. Yes, I hold a form for your freedom. Thank you. And I'll share a link to the story of those young women. Thanks, Nicole. Steve, I see Mary is here. Is Karen still reading? Uh, oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. Hi, Mary. This is Mary's poem, And Light. In twilight that night, I saw the menorah, radiant in the window, certainly beauty enough, then holiness. I saw the rabbi hold his hands high in prayer, bending again and then again and again towards the light. Thank you, Mary. Okay, Marjorie is up next. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm zooming in on this icy day from Williamsport and <laughs> I'll be reading a, a triptych response to the exhibition, a, a pantoum, a villanelle and a sonnet that are all based on the rescue mission of Eleanor and Gilbert Krauss, a couple from the Philadelphia area who worked tirelessly and um, against the odds to save 50 children. So I was really drawn into this narrative partly because my daughter's living in Collegeville right now, and that's where they um, brought the, the children. And then also just because of these very personal interviews that, that I read about. Um, for the first one, I, I learned about um, one chosen child, Heinrich Steinberger, who suddenly turned ill and he could not make the trip. And he later died with his mother in one of the concentration camps. And so another child, Alfred Berg, took his place. And I wondered what it would be like to be for uh, Alfred Berg, knowing that he was saved because another child had turned ill at the last minute. So this is the first one, the rescue mission of Eleanor and Gilbert Krauss, Alfred Berg. The eldest at 14, I took his place, Heinrich Steinberger, suddenly ill, too sick to flee to Vienna. He did not survive the Holocaust. Heinrich Steinberger, suddenly ill of the 50 chosen, the only one to stay. He did not survive the Holocaust. With my sister, I boarded the ship instead with the 50 chosen, the last one to leave with Eleanor and Gilbert Cross. With my sister, I instead boarded the ship. Often seasick, we watched movies with Eleanor and Gilbert Cross. We didn't understand the words often seasick watching movies en route to New York City and the city of brotherly love. We didn't understand the words of hatred in Vienna. Our parents Shalom carried us to New York City, then the city of brotherly love. Would we see them again? Vienna's hatred and my parents Shalom sent us to Camp Birth Shalomville. Would we see them again where we ate jello and fruit cocktail? after arriving at Camp Brith Shalomville, Shalomville. I had brought my chess set, reminder of home. For months we played, ate jello and fruit cocktail, saw doctors, practiced our English. I cherished my chess set, reminder of home, why my sister and I were cared for by others. We saw doctors, practiced our English. Finally, in December, 1939, my parents arrived. Others weren't so lucky. My sisters and I were cared for, survived. I took the place of Heinrich Steinberger, suddenly ill. Finally, in December 1939, my parents arrived. 
In Brooklyn, seven months after our flight from Vienna, we reunited, survived. Heinrich, suddenly ill, did not. That place of human hate which sickened Vienna lives on in these, quote, United States, more than 80 years after our flight from Vienna. The eldest at 14, I took Heinrich's place. He did not survive the Holocaust. And in the, then in the still and now, I, I thought about the difficulty of having to choose just 50 children out of all those who needed rescuing. The rescue mission of Eleanor and Gilbert Cross, how to choose. 25 girls, 25 boys, the children waited with their parents for the choice of who could leave and live. Between the ages of five and 14, they waited while doctors made the choice of 25 girls, 25 boys, children already waiting for visas, already trying to leave Vienna streets, soon filled with soldiers searching for those who couldn't leave and live. Between one and two million young ones gone, toddlers and teens who were once just kids, laughing, playing with toys, 25 girls, 25 boys, children now interviewed for America. Were they polite, healthy, clean, able to make the journey, able to voice why they should leave and live? Between this life and that is a gap of forever. To kill one is to kill generations, but 50 saved is a choice for 25 girls, 25 boys, their children's children, remembering who could leave and live, the choice between. And then finally, the sonnet. Um, some of the rescued children adapted very well. As I mentioned earlier, they, they came to this camp that was in Collegeville where they learned English and, and different traditions. And some of the, 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 the children um, really took so much to um, their new home that sometimes they rejected their parents when they did, uh, when they were reunited, which just broke my heart. <laughs> um, and then of course there were um, some parents who never could flee, never could escape. And so they weren't reunited. The rescue mission of Eleanor and Gilbert Krauss, waves of, of separation. The children on the ship know not to wave since hands held high look much too close to heil. Parental sacrifice to wave the, say, the way to save the ones they love the most from greater hell. Weeks later, they'll arrive at a safe shore, but far from mother, father, sibling, friend. They'll grieve their homes, but enter different doors. Some long for family, cannot start again while others cho choosing change will turn their backs on those who risked their lives to send them first. These parents now are foreign, can't retract the months of separation, all the hurt that saved their children's lives, the agony that haunts the rest. Some parents couldn't flee. Thank you. Thanks, Marjorie. Kathy Morrow is up next. Thank you. And thank you all for all of your beautiful work. Oh my goodness. Um, my poem is a found poem. I, um, I took several documents from the exhibit um, and pulled words from them and put them together into a poem. So I didn't write any of this, um, but, I, but I curated it for you. Um, and I do have uh, the text with annotations that I will put in the chat when I'm finished in case you're interested in seeing where the various voices um, came from. So this is called, I begin my story with an apology. I begin my story with an apology. Certain sinister reports are most disturbing. We must see to believe. American youth must answer no. Old glory is our flag. United, Americans want no swastika. What of tomorrow, America? The war against spies and saboteurs demands the aid of every American. 
our citizens of Japanese ancestry have been put into concentration camps in the American West. And the wolf chewed up the children and spit out their bones. But those were foreign children and it didn't really matter. Ohio beauty queens seek havens for German Jews. Jews will be wiped out unless evacuated by democracies. Three-year-old twins wonder what it's all about. Mrs. Roosevelt, please help those unhappy people. Nazis plan to kill all Jews. Certain officials have been guilty of gross procrastination, willful failure to act, willful attempts to prevent action. They certainly had a big establishment there and plenty of all kinds of equipment. On Friday, I visited a camp. This is the worst thing I have ever seen. I took pictures to make it clear. People at home, oppression and murder is all too true. Emaciated bodies lying in the yard, skin and bones, striped house coats and old clothes through the so-called barracks. Some men were still alive. One man was eating an apple. One man lying in bed dead, above his head, the picture of a girl. A few miles off the Audubon, streets narrow and winding, is a small town like any other old world town, but for the camp located at its edge. A medical captain volunteered the advice, be sure not to miss the train. One could not miss that train. These cars were littered with the dead, lifeless eyes, bulging from sunken sockets, cried out, even in death. This train was one of hundreds. I have seen, I believe, I want to tell you because I should like to have it remain in your mind. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. Kiara is up next. Hi, thank you so much um, for having me. This, uh, to the other poets, this has been amazing. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Slow Library. Um, initially, what piqued my interest into this topic, because I, um, I know it might be a little weird for me to be here for some of you, but um, I saw a 2018 film called Where Hands Touch. And this was depicting a uh, a girl who was of a descendant of a German mother and an African father who ended up falling in love with a soldier in Hitler's army. And I began to do research and wonder what else was there that I didn't know that much about the Holocaust. And um, I was sure that through white supremacy and the deletion of records that, you know, a lot of our history has been whitewashed. And um, so I, I wanted to do some more research. And I discovered that many men, women, and children who were of French African or British or American African-American descent, um, both Jewish and German were affected in the Holocaust. They were held in concentration camps. They were maimed and involuntarily sterilized. They were used for medical experimentations and they were exterminated. And so I felt these stories had to be told. Um, in 1925, of Hitler's uh, Mein Kampf, my, my Struggle, he spoke about his views about Negroes. And uh, he said, and I quote, that the Jews were responsible for bringing Negroes to Rhineland. And with the ultimate ideal of bastard, bastardizing the white race, which they had hate and lust for lowering its culture and political level so that the Jew might dominate. The mulatto children came about through rape, or the white mother was a whore. In both cases, this is not the slightest moral duty regarding these offspring of a foreign race. And then in 1933, uh, sterilization laws were then put into place. So this is what kind of inspired my piece. And I just wanted to give that briefing um, before I go into it. And this piece is called Hitlerectomy. Concrete slabs and white coats, cold rooms haunted by unborn souls. African blood supersedes the German womb, undesirables, impure, abominations to the Aryan race. 
white mothers beget black bastards, orphans in their country of origin, solutions by savages, spearhead sanitation. Brown bodies bleed with the tears of unseen offspring and men cringe with the sorrow for their unknown seed. Eggs snatched, futures shattered, Negroes neutered, females forcibly fumigated and the maiming of men's manhood. It is indeed the law. Thank you. Thank you, Kiara. Rubina is up next. Hello, can you hear yep, me? We can hear you, yep. Okay, good. Well, when I first heard about this project, I immediately thought of um, a very nice old gentleman who used to come into the library that I worked in in Williamsport, Mr. Kisberg. And uh, we had a chance to talk occasionally. I learned that he had flown with the RAF in World War II and that he had a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins in Europe before the war but none of them survived. So when I wrote this, it's, this form is called a duplex, which means there's a lot of repetition. Um, every other line reflects back to the line before, and the final line goes back to the first line. It is not uh, very personal and because it was just, it, like Tiara said, it was the law. Citizen, citizenship revoked, they had no rights. It was the law. One cold November night, their windows were shattered. Windows were shattered and property seized. No one came to help or protest. Soon they had nothing. They had nothing. They became non-persons, spit upon, ostracized, humiliated, then taken prisoner. Taken prisoner, forced to dig their own graves and shot out of hand. Hundreds of thousands packed into rail cars, shipped to the camps, shipped to labor camps, to death camps, men, women, and children. They suffered, they starved, they died and went up in smoke. The liberating commander saw the suffering, smelled the smoke, documented all, he ordered. Photograph it or no one will believe this. It is hard to believe the scope and depth of those atrocities, but no one spoke for them and they had no recourse. It was the law. And I have a couple of other things to add, if you don't mind. Uh, one about, <clears throat> it was difficult to believe. My friend, Chris Sanchez, who is almost as old as I am, wrote a paper when she was in maybe ninth or 10th grade, which would have been, I don't know, maybe between 50, 1958, 1960. It was about the Holocaust and her teacher gave her an F because no one would do that. Well, <clears throat> Chris's father showed the paper to the principal and the teacher was fired. I have noticed very recently a couple of 
related events to this Holocaust thing. If any of you saw 60 Minutes on January 2nd, it was about a, a number of German board, born Jews who joined the US Army as part of a top secret unit. And as they were native speakers and familiar with the culture, they were able to home in on uh, some subtleties in language when they were questioning German POWs. And they were able to save a lot of lives. Also, I noticed that there's going to be an Ollie course next month. And the presenter's mother survived the Holocaust. And she had been in two different uh, concentration camps. And I, I believe this presenter has taken what she wrote later about her experiences and has done something with it. It may be uh, ready to publish. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew about those things because if you could go back and, and watch that 60 minutes, it would certainly be profitable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robina. Michelle Meckel is up next. She is our second to last, possibly last speaker for the night. Hello, everyone. And I wanna thank the presenters for their incredibly touching, beautiful work. I wanna thank Shlo and Maria. I wanna thank the Art Alliance and Marie, and I wanna thank Steve. Um, I am half Roma and I am half Jewish. My father was a survivor. Um, this is my father. He um, volunteered for the Polish army at 17, thinking that this would save the family. That thinking was wrong. This piece is called Legacy. Names and ages were changed to blur identities. Moves were made to start elsewhere anew. But this wasn't the witness protection program. Possessions and fortunes vanished in an instant and home became a haunting memory. But this wasn't a bankruptcy. Millions of lives were brutally taken. Their survivors bore marks inside and out. But this wasn't a pandemic. This was, this is, my inheritance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Gosh, um, I wasn't actually expecting to cry tonight, but well, I did. So um, we have one last possible piece. Marie, are you prepared to read? The final statement or? Yes, I would be happy to. Um, Great. One of our very talented artists in the Art Alliance is uh, Susie uh, Weiss. Some of you may know her. Um, and for this exhibition, she did a woodcut portrait of her husband, her late husband, um, Bino Weiss. So um, I will read this to you. Uh, born in Ab Abbasina, Italy, to Isaac Weiss and Rachel Grossman, both of Poland, along with his sister Eugenie, Benno and his parents survived the Holocaust in Italy. They were interned in several small towns and then hidden from the Nazis by quiet, heroic farmers. On several occasions, they were nearly discovered and once the ally, ally, allies invaded, they survived multiple bombings by hiding in the cellars of nearby buildings. Still a child, Benno eventually earned some money by serving as a translator for the English and American troops. His family then lived in a series of camps for displaced persons. All of his other relatives were killed by the Nazis in Poland. He and his family arrived in the United States in 1950 and settled in New York City. 
we met in 1965 in an Italian restaurant in Greenwich Village and were married in 1968, moving to State College in 1969, where when he accepted a teaching position at Penn State University in the Department of Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. Our children, Alexandro and Gabriella, were raised with the knowledge that history matters. Hatred toward any group of people is intolerable, and the only antidote to hatred is education. So I hope you will go to the library and see her, her wonderful woodcut. She did a great job with it. Thank you. Thank you.